Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this week's episode of Sounds of the Diaspora, artist to artist conversation with yours truly, Dion Parson. I'd like to give a special shout out to our audience in California, LA precisely, but in the California, California region. Our guest today, Hills from California, is going to be joining us shortly, but I just wanted to say we're very excited to have this gentleman here. He's a composer, film scorer, NAACP Image Award winner, amongst other things. And um, he's a really, really cool guy, man. So um, join me in welcoming to Sounds of the Diaspora, the one and only Mr. Jean-Nique Bontemp. Thank you, Dion, for that wonderful, wonderful, wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to it. Oh man, bro, you already have, man. You, you're doing all the stuff you're doing. <laughs> Again, to you know, you know, talking to you before the show, um, it's just put a smile on my face. I'm just happy when um, I see great things happening in our community and and folks coming from our Afro Caribbean diaspora just just leading the charge in their field of of um, service and uh, professionalism. So thank you for what all the great things you do. Oh, listen, I, you know what? I didn't really have much of a choice because God planted this thing in my heart to you know, write music and share it with the world. I tried to run away, you know, but mm. apparently he decided to reel me right back in and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I feel so blessed. That's a beautiful thing. I, I, I know the feeling, I know the feeling, you know, as we grew up, especially in a West Indian household, we have certain expectations. There's a there's a strict work ethic, and and you have to kind of abide by those things. Um, when I told my mother that I was, I was going to be a world renowned drummer. When I told her that in seventh grade, I wasn't even playing drums. I was playing trombone. She just kind of looked at me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, "That's nice, son. Uh, we all should have." Dreams. <laughs> that was my encouragement. <laughs> And and when I when I went to college and and did my thing and got my music education degree, she was like, "Okay, see, now you can get a job." I'm like, "No, this is for you. I'm going on tour." And right. That that did not sit well at all. But fast forward thirty years later, we can sit and look back and smile at it. So I know you have a similar story because you were like you were up in corporate America for a while. I was, I was, because you know so much of. Uh the importance you know of us growing up was that we had a stable life right Direct. you know my parents came from the caribbean my father's haitian mother's jamaican and they both came here at a young age and started at the bottom you know my father mm -hmm. started as a runner new york stock exchange my mother was a housekeeper and they both put themselves through education and you know my dad when he retired he was a vice president of dean witter and my mom was an educator at the Educational Opportunity Center in Brooklyn. So nice. talk about, you know, leaving your home, coming to a foreign land and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. right? All so that we kids, well, we didn't exist at the time, obviously, but that the promise of their kids will have right. a stable life. So stability was through education. And through the education, you can get a good job, right? And then through that job, you can have a stable life. Right. Being an artist, being a musician, that was not part of that equation. <laughs> <laughs> that was not part of the calculus. Right. So, right. you know, growing up, even though my mom sacrificed that we all had music lessons, being a musician was never part of the calculus it was never part of the life journey because i needed to have something that was stable and what are the stable jobs you know in a caribbean household you're either a doctor mm -hmm. a lawyer an educator right mm -hmm. and that was really about it right or you go into finance or you right? go into the military i mean in a... the military yeah. that's right and that was really it those were the options and for me i was going to be a lawyer I was going to go off and study law uh, and be a civil rights attorney. Okay. Uh, as a kid, you know, I was enamored with Martin Luther King. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I listened to Public Enemy, you know, coming out of Strong Island. 
So I was definitely civically minded and I wanted to work to provide protection for our people. So that was always purpose and music was just going to be decided. You know, not even a hustle, but just a hustle. But all throughout uh, middle school, high school, I was playing music, playing. I accompanied people on the piano as pianists. I accompanied singers at school. I was in the jazz band, rock band. Uh, we even made albums. I mm. worked at Sam Ash Music all through high school. Nice. So I went out on Long Island. So I was always around this mu music thing and music production. And I was just blinded to it. Because you know why? And this is what's tough. There was no real role model for what I thought I could do. I was never really a great performer, right? I got anxiety when I had to play the piano in front of people. It was never really my thing. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed writing music. You know, I enjoyed sequencing, all that kind of stuff. And all of my teachers, right, who were amazing and really talented pianists and musicians, jazz pianists or classical pianists, they had a tough time making a living. Mm -hmm. Most of them lived home with their mothers and they taught, you know, during the day and they gigged at night. And, mm -hmm. you know, I love my mother, but I was not planning on living with her for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. I, 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 you. I feel you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so there really was no role model for me to see a different life, to see a different right. possibility. So music was not going to be the thing. I was going to go to college and become a lawyer. Okay. Yeah, okay. We're going to keep on going. Then. All right. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay, gonna go to college, become a lawyer, but that I'm like that didn't happen. Well, you you did corporate America for a while. I did, I did. So what ended up happening is I went to college, and I still ended up studying music because I figured, you know what, I'm gonna go to law school. I keep just delaying this thing. I'm gonna go to law school. <laughs> so what I study in undergrad doesn't really matter. Right. As long as I get A's mm -hmm. and I do well in the LSAT, I can the, go to law school. Law school, right. Right. And I love music, so I'll do well. Well, you know, so far that was a great plan up until about junior year when I had to take 20th century composition. Oh, yeah. The straight A's went out the window at that <laughs> point. I just couldn't get my head around, uh, you know, 12 tone music mm -hmm. or music concrete. You know, it just was something that didn't really resonate well with me. So my compositions in that were less than basic. So right. I, think I got a C in that class. It's like the only C I got. Uh, uh, not good for law school, you know, for, for your law school. Not good for the law school application. But what put the nail in the coffin was the LSAT. Okay. My LSAT score came back. I was not going to law school. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, nope, this ain't going to happen. So when I graduated with my newly minted music degree, I didn't know how to actually use it to make a living because the plan was to continue school, not right. to get a job. So what was the music degree in, like education, performance, production? Well, I did my undergrad at Yale, and okay. there was really no focus on the music degree. It was a general music degree. So you did oh, some 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 history, some composition, right, right. some theory, some musicianship. So it was a general degree. But the funny thing is, I did an intensive major because I did two independent studies. So I spent my junior year doing an independent study, my senior year doing an independent study. My junior year was in music production. Okay. I co-founded and ran the undergraduate recording studio. Nice. And I was actually able to get credit for running the studio and getting paid. So I would charge 20 bucks an hour for the studio, 10 would go into my pocket, 10 would go into the studio. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would just sort of write papers and meet with the professor once a week and I got credit for that. Mm -hmm. so that was great. Okay. And then my second independent study, I went from New Haven to New York City to 550 Madison Avenue, Sony Records. back mm -hmm. in the And I had an internship at Epic Black in the marketing department. Okay. So I learned all about uh, A&R, marketing and product management, um, distribution, radio distribution, street teams. Because I was in the middle of all of this, right? 
right. in 550 Madison Avenue. So obviously they were getting free labor out of me, but I was writing papers about it, meeting with a professor once a week, and I got college credit for it. So you I got, decided what I, You got the information, which is, you got the recipe. That's, that's that, correct. Right. So when I got out of school, I was able to finagle a job right at 550 Madison Avenue, Epic Black. And I was uh, assisting two product managers. One I had worked with during my internship and a new one that they just hired. Let's just say that myself and the new product manager did not get along. We did not see eye to eye. Uh, apparently I could do nothing right in her eyes. And I thought I was trying. I thought mm -hmm. I was trying, but okay. it didn't work out. And at the end of the four months, he's like, goodbye. So mm -hmm. here I am, you know, living in my apartment with my roommates in Brooklyn. I, just reminiscing a little bit. This was back in like 96. We okay. had a three bedroom apartment, two floors, two bathrooms, three of us living there. We were paying like $1,200 a month. Right, right. right. <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve hundred bucks a it's, month. Yeah. So, but you know, now I had rent to pay. That was expensive back then because I had a I had a two bedroom in Harlem and I was paying five fifty. Oh what! I should have been a roommate with you, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that time, I, you don't know no, for real, but but again, it's, you can't get that now. Nowhere close no. to that. Yeah. Not even close. Not even close. Twelve hundred dollars. Anything in New York City, you probably have a matchbox, you know. But right. I ended up. Um, uh, getting this, uh, sorry, I ended up living with some roommates, really enjoyed being there, uh, and I wanted to keep it, so I had to get a new job. And this is before monster.com, I remember this is 96, 97, that an ad in the paper, computer programmer wanted no experience necessary. <laughs> okay. Now, I like, like, that's, that's me. me. <laughs> that's me. I like computers, and I have no experience. This is right. going to be right so i circle the ad i go down make the phone call make the appointment for the interview uh and i get hired on the spot i guess i gave a great interview so mm. i show up at this guy's apartment because he was starting a new company i was his first employee he, he agrees to pay me i think twenty two thousand dollars a year or whatever maybe twenty six thousand dollars a year uh because i wanted insurance i wanted benefits my mom said always make sure you get your benefits right so you get the benefits right uh so i show up at his house i think wednesday thursday friday sunday for training monday i'm at the client as the expert now you're the expert i'm the expert after four days of training <laughs> now i am not the expert at all right and <laughs> let me tell you it was a harrowing first day and i almost got fired because i couldn't generate the report that was needed for this thing that they needed uh, as a company mm. as the expert i couldn't do it but i had the smarts i don't know what maybe god whispered this into my ears to take the database home on a 3.5 inch floppy. The whole thing could fit on a 3.5 inch floppy. <laughs> Take it back to my new boss in Manhattan. And we worked on the report together. And I found that their previous reports had a $3.5 million error. Mm. So I take my newly minted report in the next day. I show them exactly why the previous reports were wrong and why this report was solid. And at that point on, they didn't question me again. In right. their eyes, I was the expert. But let me tell you, for the next two months, I took my work back every night to Manhattan to do the work for the day. Right. So the next day that they had everything pristine. I did that and worked with this guy for about a year. And at the end of the year, I was his number one consultant. I was mm. building programs for this uh, strategic sourcing initiative. And everybody loved me right because i worked hard i figured out how to take the initiative on things and software was came naturally to me okay came naturally and you know we can talk about the similarities between software and music right 
I think they have a lot of similarities, both based on math, both having a language you have to deal with, both sort of, uh, <laughs> I think the one big difference is with computer programming, there's usually a right or a wrong answer that mm -hmm. will compile or work. Music, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> Right. Actually, everything could fit if you know how to, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's also based on taste. Right. I can say something's great, but then you could say, you know, that's not so great. And here's the right. reason why, because why I don't like it, right? Right, right. Let's get to a certain point. I mean, we could talk about, you know, things not flowing right, not having the right uh, counterpoint, uh, not keeping our voice leading correctly or harmonization. We could talk about all those things. But once at a certain point at a level and you know all those things, then it's just about taste. Right. Do I like piece of music or not? But anyway, we digress. We'll get back to that later. So I get a little, you know, full of myself at this point, you know, about nine months in. Mm -hmm. And I asked the guy for a raise because I knew he was charging the client over a hundred bucks an hour for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was getting paid again, $26,000 an hour, $26,000 for the year, right. which I guess equates to something like 15 to 20 bucks an hour or whatever right so he was copping all of this cash right for my labor and i said hey man listen i get it you're running a business here this overhead all this stuff i'm running your other consultants and i'm training them now as well because at this point he had grown the company and i was like his number one dude it's like tell you what can we just split the dollar fee give me 50 bucks you take 50 bucks i'll take 50 bucks give me a raise we'll be happy Guy said no. He said, nope, not going to do it. Wow. Said, okay. Well, you know what? At that point, this is 97 now. And the computer programming market is hot because Amazon had just sort of come out with this e-commerce thing selling books. So everybody was looking for e-commerce programmers now. And at this point, I had SQL databases under my belt. I had some Visual Basic. I was programming, right? So I take my newfound skills, put it out into the job market, and I get my second job at a place called N2K. Now, N2K. N well, I remember N2K, yeah. You know N2K. I think I was hoping you would recognize N2K. Yeah. Okay? So N2K was a music and mm -hmm. software technology company, right? Mm -hmm. They had a site called Music Boulevard that sold CDs online. Mm -hmm. We had Jazz Central Station, Rocktropolis, and Classical Insights, which were all genre-based community sites that basically created community and then fed the community with CDs, right? Right. And I came in as an HTML developer there, and I thought, my life is peak. There, there's nowhere else for me to go. I'm actually able to pull together my music production skills, my music marketing skills, my technology skills, all together in this one company. I can stay here for the rest of my life. <laughs> I, I, I was so happy. Well, let's just say I did not stay there for the rest of my life. Uh, and it was well, the tumultuous year. <laughs> no, the, the company didn't stay around that long either. That's right. The company yeah. did not it was a great, stay around. So, I have some friends on the table. I actually, I, I, I think I recorded once for them. Yeah. Yeah, because they had their own record label as yeah. well. Yeah. And I remember we would run around and do we were on the cutting edge of stuff because we would run around places like Blue Note mm -hmm. and broadcast Blue Note uh, performances and concerts over the Internet. We would right. order an ISDN line. We show up with all this hardware to basically it stream. Edge. It was taking music to a whole nother level. I remember having conversations with guys talking about, man, I got to get on the N2K label because that's like that was like one of the first streaming platforms. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I was there. I was basically grew up in that technology environment. I started as an HTML developer, and mm. by the time the company folded, I was manager of client side technologies. So wow. I grew and I had a staff, and I was in charge of all the front end applications, right, and programming for all of the websites, uh, including the streaming stuff that the company was doing. So I grew pretty fast. And then when the company folded, I just jumped around with these guy group of guys, and we just built websites for various companies uh we did a company called skymall.com remember skymall skymall yeah, oh, on yeah. The, on the air, they had the, they had the magazines and the book and then you could go online and that's and right us. Yeah. yeah so i built out their second generation website and i had a whole team in new york city and we were responsible for building out the skymall platform uh then 
I went over a company called Fresh Direct. I don't know if anybody knows about Fresh Direct, the <laughs> online grocer in New York City. I was their VP of technology and mm -hmm. in charge of, you know, basically again, building out their front end e-commerce platform. Then I went to a company called Bluefly.com and we, it was a fashion retailer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm on this trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. And every place we're going, um, making money, doing big things, I'm enjoying my life, having stability. I was able to marry my childhood sweetheart who I met when I was 11 years old. Okay. And, you know, we're, we're living in Brooklyn. We have our first child. We buy a place in Park Slope. I mean, life is good, right? And then eventually, we end up moving to California. And I end up in Silicon Valley. I mean, now I'm at the epitome, right? Of, <laughs> I'm in Silicon Valley working at a startup. And the startup was doing software security. So I am so excited with my life. And I really feel that God has blessed me tremendously, right, to allow me to have this life. We're doing really well. But the funny thing is, I wasn't 100% happy. And I didn't know I wasn't happy. Something was missing. Something was missing. And the funny thing is, when you have all of the accoutrement, right? We had the beautiful house on the hill. We had our cars. We had, you know, I was traveling all over the world. I had teams of software developers all over the world, right? And I was basically being groomed to be the, the Black Bill Gates, right? Over time. So, so I was like, I have runway. This is great. But I still wasn't 100% happy. And that was showing up in very sort of insidious ways in my life. And I was lying in bed one night and I was asking God, like, God, what's wrong? What's, what's, what's going on? Why are things not where they should be? They should be great. I mean, everything that my parents And I just listened. And these words form in my mind. If you trust me, trust me with the vision of your life. Mm -hmm. And that logic was irrefutable. And I resisted because my vision, my life was pretty good at that time. Right. It was like, great vision. But God's like, if you trust me, trust me with the vision of your life. And those words rattled around in my head for a long time. And eventually I gave in and I said, God, fine. I will give up everything that I'm working toward right now. I will just let go of that vision in my mind. And I will allow you to please replace it with what you want for my life. You know, the first thing that actually God uh, encouraged me to do was, what was play that? piano. Play, so you went back and played? I started playing the piano again. Now, this is the same piano that my parents bought for me when I was six years old. And I okay. lugged that to every place that I lived, including across the country. And I hadn't touched it in like 15 years. And I saw mm -hmm. it there and I just went and started playing again. And I started picking up my old books again. And mm -hmm. I started actually taking jazz lessons, you know, jazz piano lessons. Right. And then I started playing in church and I was really enjoying it. Now, listen. I was not an amazing church musician. The church musicians are bad. They play, you know, any song, <laughs> any key at any time or whatever. I was not that guy. I was like the third string piano player, the guy on the keyboard that would do a couple runs and a few stabs every now and then. That was me. But still, I enjoyed it, right? And I had a great time. I'm under the band until the piano player got there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> until the real piano player got there. That's right. That's exactly right. I was just playing, man. I was just playing. Oh, but no, 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 dude. It was true. I mean, look. It's, it's beautiful. It's, your story is beautiful, man. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's real. It's, it's real. real. But you Listen, and you you did something. You know, you started playing piano again, and it is it led to where you are now. Well, again, here's the thing about God. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, He didn't lay this vision out at that point. It was mm. baby steps, little right. by little, right? Because probably if He had told me you're going to do the things you're doing, I would have freaked out. Like, no, there's no way I'm going back to software. Right. But it was little things. I still I still had my job. I was still working, right? But playing the piano. Then I found this thing called GarageBand. Right. And I was like, whoa, 
this is pretty awesome. It's like a full sequence on my laptop. And I start writing some music in GarageBand. And I realized I could still write some music. You know, I have a couple chords here and there. Nothing great. I would never have played for anybody now. But I did something mm -hmm. instrumental. And I sent it to a friend of mine. And she said to me, that sounds like film music. Okay. No, no, no. You don't understand. I had never paid attention to music in film. My mind was blown. I said, like, wait a minute. There's music in film? There's music in video games? Right. You gotta be kidding me. And that's a job? Oh, yeah. wait a minute. I think I want that job. I can do that job. Right? And it hit me. This is something that I need to pursue. So I do a little Google search at that point in time. Google was around. And the first, how to become a film composer. And the first thing that pops up was Berkeley School of Music Online. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking online lessons with Berkeley. And I'm still working my full-time job. But I'm loving it. I'm leaving my full-time job every day to run home to do my music homework. And orchestration and right. film scoring and video game scoring. I'm having the best time ever. I find a school in San Francisco called Pyramide. And I start taking Pro Tools classes up there and start interning. And, oh. you know, I'm working my full-time job, making a great salary, right? But then I'm going at night to intern, to set up for events, you know, taking out the trash, whatever, just to be as part of the community. And mm -hmm. I didn't tell anybody what I really did. One event that I was there for, it was for the uh, unveiling of the Uncharted video game. It was the second one. And I was just chatting it up with somebody uh, in the audience. And I was telling them my story. I was like, yeah, I want to become a film a game composer. I'm currently in software, blah, 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 blah. We're chopping it up about uh, video games that we love, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? At the end of the conversation, like, you know what? I like you. Why don't you come down to my offices next week and we'll sit down and talk about your story some more and how we can get you into game scoring. I was like, okay, great. Well, who are you? It's like, oh, but, oh, I'm the vice president of um, vice president of music for Sony Games. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> look at that, full circle, right? I'm like, what? Full circle. How, how can I meet this guy? And then he gets, you know, basically pull, pulls me into uh, Sony. And he tells me one thing, which is no one in Silicon Valley, no one up here is going to hire you to do games, do music for their games while you still have a full-time job. You have to go to USC and Tabla Rasa start over. And that was tough. But mm -hmm. yet again, God made a way and me and my family we packed up into the car, drove down to L.A., and I got into USC. Wow. And I did the USC film scoring program, the grad school program. And that's what launched this blessed career that I have now in film scoring. Well, man, that's that's a beautiful I, – I know there's more to the story, and, you know, time is, is of the essence, but you, you've, you know, you've weaved us through – all of the stuff you've been through in the past, like what, 15, 20 years to get to this point. And it's, a, it's an amazing story, man. And I, I just you. want to applaud you for, for believing because that's, I think that's half of it. Just believing, you know, you have to, you have to trust the process. And, and, you know, we all, we all have that similar story. Almost every guest that I've had on just say, at some point I had to just trust mm -hmm. the path and, and make that happen, man. And you've done some great things. And uh, I know our audience is, is saying like, wow, this is really great. Let's hear what he's doing. I love to play, I love to play you know, one, of, one of your songs so they can hear what you've accomplished. And we still have more to tell because you know, you've been doing some great things within the last 24 hours that we need to let them know about. That's true, but, uh, that's true. thank you. Let's, um, let's check out Till All or One, and then you could tell us what it is, Till All or One. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm giving you the wrong one. I'm giving you the wrong one. Morning routine. Morning routine. <laughs> morning routine is the first one, yeah. Yes, let's check out morning routine.
Morning routine. Morning routine. <laughs> and that's that was on Disney, right? That wasn't that a Disney. That is correct. That is uh, from a movie called World's Best that is okay. currently streaming on Disney Plus. Okay. And it's about a South Asian American family that is dealing with the grief of losing uh, the father of the patriarch and discovering him through rap music. Okay. So, yeah, I co scored that with a wonderful and very talented South Asian American composer. Her name is Rashi Kulkarni. And this was our second movie that we did together, the first one being Wedding Season, which is on Netflix. And, you know, the thing that's pretty much uh, wonderful about the score is really the melding of both the hip hop, but mm -hmm. also the South Asian influences, right? You heard some of the vocals there, which were based on South Asian uh, music swarums, right? Oh. And we worked with these two wonderful uh, vocalists, um, Kiri and Niven, who have like an amazing online following, and they did all the vocal work in there. Uh, I brought in, obviously, my hip hop experience from growing up in the 80s and 90s in New York, and really sort of bringing that boom bap so that this way we could feel the authenticity from there. And, you know, we then brought in a whole slew of South Asian instruments and other kind of uh, techniques that Rashi grew up with. So it became this wonderful sort of melding pot of a score that is extremely unique and, you know, I think resonates well with the film. That's that's great. And this is all programmed. Besides no, no, the voice. That, was all, that was live. Oh, that this was, was all live? That was, that was all live. live. We recorded it at the Village in New York City. Uh, okay. So the brass and the strings are live in there. And then the rest is programmed. So the drum okay. machine. Uh, right. So probably, right. Yeah, the drums are definitely not live. It's like, yeah, I know some live drums. <laughs> it's, a hybrid drums hybrid recording. it's a hybrid recording. It's a yes. hybrid recording, yeah. So in that that you heard the electric bass, the vocal mm -hmm. strings, and the pop brass section were all live. Everything okay. else was electronic. That's why I was going to ask you because I'm listening. I'm like, man, this it has that element. Is there's some organic essence to it as well, and uh, really nice. Um, so this really shows your creative skills as a composer, and the fact that you can lean towards other genre and draw from your your childhood experiences makes you uh, someone that's like really aware of what the industry needs. That's right. right. You know, when I first got to USC. Um, right before I started, I got the chance to talk to this guy named Chris Beck. And Chris Beck is an amazing composer, has a storied career. He worked on things like Frozen 1, Frozen 2, mm -hmm. uh, the Ant-Man uh, series, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So he's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance to meet him at an event right before I started USC. And it was my big chance. So I rolled up there and I said, Chris. You went to Yale undergrad, I went to Yale undergrad. You went to USC film scoring program, I'm going to USC film scoring program. I just want to be a black you, show me the way, right? Okay. <laughs> and he laughed, you know, chuckled. And then uh, after chopping up some more, he said to me, JB, listen, I don't know why I'm telling you this because I just met you, but I like you and I want to impart some advice on you. He says, one, Hollywood is a young town when you're starting out. And the people that you're probably going to be interacting with, they're going to be young. And this is looking for young people to start their careers. He said, but you have a, and at this point, remember, I'm second career. So I am, I think, 37 years old at this point. I have a wife and two kids. So I wouldn't call myself super young at the right. time. But he said, you have a youthful demeanor and you've got a great energy. So just don't bring your kids around, right? To give away your age. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, he was saying the black don't crack, don't advertise. <laughs> right, right, right. The good advice. <laughs> the advice. Right. But he said the second thing is then you can't hide the fact that you are black and that there are not many people that look like you doing this job. Right at the level at which you want to do it. Right. And when people look at you, they are not <laughs> the that they want to 
or Four. show. Mm -hmm. That really hurt my heart, right? Because what that meant in my mind at the time was that I'm going to be relegated to a certain type of project. Right. right? And I had aspirations to work on big, you know, Hollywood movies, big action movies, big dramas, and that those opportunities were going to be hard for me. So when I got into USC, I doubled down and I left aside any of the hip hop music that I've been working on or the R&B or gospel, left it all aside and said, I'm just going to focus on making Hollywood sounding music. Mm -hmm. So much so that my capstone project at the end of the year, we get to record with a huge orchestra at Warner Brothers and we get to write music for a scene. You know, I picked Lord of the Rings. Oh, wow. a scene that I rescored. Okay. Hey, no black people in Lord of the Rings. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, nothing African American in Lord of the Rings. Right. But, you know, I wrote this big epic orchestral piece of music that I thought was going to be what Hollywood wanted. Right. But I was only getting opportunities to score, and I say only in quotes, to get opportunities to score African American projects, Latino right. projects. You know, occasionally I would get an Asian uh, filmmaker that would hire me. Mm -hmm. And I was working on stories from people of color. And I actually didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be labeled as the black composer because at that time, I thought that was going to stymie and limit my potential in my career. Right. So I said, this is not going to be great for me. And I really resisted that. I got a chance to talk with another more established film composer, this guy named Teddy Shapiro, who's done things like The Devil Wears Prada, um, uh, Tropic Thunder, right? He's currently the composer for Severance right now on Apple TV. And he said to me, well, who do you want to be labeled as? Do you want to be labeled as a mini John Williams? Do you want to be a mini Hans Zimmer? Or this is the music you know. You know African-American music. You know R&B, hip hop, gospel, jazz. Be labeled as the black composer and do it with authenticity and skill, right? Mm -hmm. And then projects will come to you and at some point in your life will be able to. You will, and then you'll pick, you can pick and choose, yeah. That's, yeah. that's good advice. That's good it advice. Was great advice. And as soon that's as I did that and embraced that, my career took off. And it started with a film called United Skates that was uh, won Tribeca, went to Tribeca, went to HBO. And mm -hmm. from that film getting such wide distribution in United Skates, uh, I was able to just get so much more exposure. And I was getting opportunities to score things left and right from that one movie when I embraced who I was. Right. Well, we are uh, we're very excited because you know you, you shared a lot with us. You've really opened up and, and and let our audience know who you are. And we have another song that will share some more of, to our audience who you are. And uh, you could tell us uh, "Safe House Chilling." That's what we're ah. going to do next. Safe House Chilling. Safe house chilling. That's right. What's that the 
is from the video game Redfall, which is a first person vampire shooter. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to have a score that embodied uh, hip hop, New England, and vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can hear it because I'm sitting there going, I'm like, okay, this sounds like some something's to come around the corner after you. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, it's intriguing, but it's funky. Yeah, that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted something that was modern, right? Mm -hmm. That lent into hip hop, but also would be great in a in a you know fight for your life situation. Right. So the entire score is just that melding, and I had a great time doing it. And again, another example, and just really leaning into who I am as a composer, as a person, the genres that I love. And I'm now finding I'm building a career of pulling together all of these genres, all these ideas, and authentically making them with craft and skill into music that can tell stories. Well, you're doing a good job of that because I heard that story. I mean, I'm a musician, so I'm following the music. And again, when you watch a, a movie, the music changes based on the scene. The chord structure changes, so it opened up. This song opened up with a dark kind of vibe. So I'm like, yeah, something's getting ready to happen. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly correct. You're right. that's the whole thing. I'm trying to tell stories, you know, with music without lyrics, and a lot of that is uh, trying to add another level to what you're seeing on screen. I right. don't want to mirror what you see on screen because you already have that information. Right. What can I say that's not being said? What can I say that's not being showed? How, How can you can I add a deeper yeah. layer right. right, to the storytelling? And yes. that's what I love to do. And do it, hopefully, with something that's interesting. Great, great. I love it. I love it. I'm enjoying this because you're such a unique guest because you're the first composer we've had on. And, you know, I mean, all the other guests are performers, but they compose also. But this is a – this is – you know, there's one thing I want to ask you about film scoring. We don't have that much time, but – have you back because I want you to share with our audience the process of film scoring because people don't realize there's a, a way to line up the film with the music and that's the next step I want to talk about that. I mean this oh yeah yeah we can yes. spend a whole hour on that. I do a workshop on that at schools, things like that. So we can definitely walk that we're gonna talk about that next time. But I want to jump to this next song, the one I mentioned out of out of sequence, till all or one. Let's check out till all or one. That's very, uh, it's, it's, it's intense. You can hear something that's good to happen. There's a, a, a comment here from uh, one of our audience members saying, I was raised on Transformers and you did that? Yes, I did. So that is from Transformers Rise of the Beasts. 
the mm-hmm. movie that just came out last summer. And I was grew up with Transformers. You know, as a kid, I was Optimus Prime. So okay. when one of the filmmakers that I had worked with, Stephen Capel Jr., all through grad school, remember I went to grad school for uh, film scoring, mm-hmm. and I met a ton of directors there. One of the directors' his name was Stephen Capel Jr., and I've worked with him for the past 12 years on everything that he's done. When he had the opportunity or was asked to direct Transformers Rise of the Beast, he put my name in the hat, and through a series of events, I was invited to be the composer for the movie. Now, here's a couple things. Remember when we, at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about the dream of my mm-hmm. life, the vision of my life? Yes. I am the first African-American to score a summer blockbuster feature. Impressive. Nice. I mean... I, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I've been thinking a lot about, like, who you know is in who's worked in this industry and the movies that they've done, and you know before this movie, an African American had never stub had scored a blockbuster su- uh, summer feature, mm. and I was amazed. It's like how can God, right, say this is going to be the vision of your life, and I'm so happy that I followed this path. Right, and it's given me such an amazing opportunity to not just have opportunities for myself, but also to open the doors for others and hopefully show other people that you can do this too. Well, you know, one of our listening audience just gave you two wonderful uh, compliments. One said, uh, super dope on what you're doing and congratulations to you for being a trailblazer. And I'm going to take this moment right now to pause because I was a little taken back today as I was speaking to my youngest sister. I was talking to her and I said, I have to go and get ready for the show. I'm going back to work to clean up, you know, my desk and finish up some work and get ready for the show. She said, yeah, you're your guest tonight. And she was trying to pronounce your name. Uh, Jean, I said, Jeanique. He said, yeah, she, he won the Image Award for the NAACP last night. And, I, you know, I, I'm not on Facebook like that. So I was like, really? She was like, yeah, he he did. I was like, well, look at that, man. I got to up my game for my show tonight because now I have my NAACP Image Award guest on the show. I didn't even know. So, I mean. Well, you know, it happened last night. So, yes. You know, <laughs> so it's 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 uh, cutting news. But, yes, uh, this year, the NAACP Image Awards, a.k.a. the Black Oscars, right, mm-hmm. Uh they added a original score category. So the category is outstanding score uh, for film and TV. And this is the first time that they're actually having this category. Mm-hmm. And I found out last night that they are honoring me with the award for this category. And remember when I said in the beginning, when I started 12 years ago, there weren't many people that looked like me mm-hmm. right, doing this. The landscape has changed. It's changing. Right. And in this, my fellow nominees, uh, all women and people of color, right, who I all know and love. And we now have a groundswell, you know, of people entering the industry so that the composer position will now start to reflect what the world looks like in all the beautiful shades and hues and shapes and sizes and orientations. Right. Which is wonderful because having that diversity, having those voices to tell stories is, I think, just going to give us a richer musical landscape, a richer story landscape. So I'm extremely honored that I am the inaugural recipient of the award for this category. Congratulations again. Well deserved. Well Thank deserved. You. Thank you, know, you. One of the things that I, I, I hear as you speak, and I admire because it's, it's part of you know my journey and, and the things that were sh- embedded in me was education. Mm. Education is key because education doesn't necessarily always mean having to go to college and getting a degree. Education is getting the information yes. for the job you're doing and do it well. And that's what you have presented and that's why you're being honored on the level you have. And you, you know, you're a great example for for um, our uh, young audience and um, youngsters coming up. So congratulations again, man. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am never afraid to invest in that. 
And along the way, I did the uh, film program there, the European American Music Alliance mm -hmm. uh, in France. I did that summer program. I did more work at Berkeley School of Music Online, as I mentioned before. So, you know, school and education is just part of the job. And there's always more music to learn, always different genres to understand. And I'm along for this lifelong journey of just learning and incorporating and expanding my musical footprint. Well, it definitely shows in what you've accomplished. Definitely. Um, I, JB, I want to share with our audience um, one more song that you, that you presented to us and um, as we wrap this up. But... Um, well, let, let me play this song first, and I'm going to tell you my last comment because it's a good one. Um, we have typewriter resistance. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Definitely sounds like a typewriter. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that. Yeah. Definitely is a typewriter. That is from the documentary My Name is Murray Murray by the Oscar winning directors uh, Betsy Cohen and Cohen and Julie, Julie West. Um, and it's about the civil rights leader and thought uh, thought leader, Paulie Murray who basically architected the arguments that both Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg used in their Supreme Court arguments for civil rights. So much so that they both named Pauli as a co-author. Okay. And yes, that was a typewriter because Pauli wrote many of their dissertations and their ideas using a typewriter. So I figured let's incorporate a typewriter into the score as a homage so we could actually hear Paulie's typing as part of the music. Right, because in this day and age, the average person don't even know what a typewriter is. No. <laughs> That's very true. But you know, I did my college education at typewriter, so I know what typewriters sound like. <laughs> <laughs> That's like something of a relic time, but when we went to college, we had typewriters. Yeah, I had typewriters. That's right. <laughs> room. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So that's beautiful. Every, everybody say like that's something from the past, but it's, <laughs> it's still a major contributor to what we're doing. That's right. And, you know, so again, so much of the freedoms that we enjoy in this country were made on a typewriter, right? Or were architected on a typewriter. So really, Paulie Murray is an American hero. And I wanted the music to show that Paulie is an American hero. Right. One of the things I was going to say before we played that last piece was um, what I'm enjoying with this conversation is not only are you talking about the music and can explain the music, but you're actually talking about the product that the music is in. You're talking about the film, the directors, the actors, the, 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 the producers. And I'm, you know, that means a lot because a lot of times we get hired to do stuff and we don't even know the other side of it. It's like, I need a song for this. And you just submit a song. and mm -hmm. But you never know what it is until you hear the finished product. From a musician standpoint, that's happened to me so many times. And I would follow up with people. Hey, man, you know, I did this track for you. Can you send me what it is? And, and I never hear it until I hear it on the radio. And it's like, wow, like two years later, it's like, that's me playing drums. And I never got a copy of it or anything. And it's really, it's really refreshing to hear that um, you actually 
have been part of the product, uh, the, the production from the inception to the to the end. Because as as performers uh, and creative personnel, we get left out in a lot of that. We just contribute our piece, and that's it. So, thanks for being, you know, thanks for being that uh, descriptive in your presentation. No, well, you know, as a film composer, I'm a filmmaker, right? right. I'm a storyteller, and I am part of the team that's making the film. So yes, I have to understand the director's vision, the producer's vision, because I'm writing 45 minutes, hour and a half, two hours of music right. to support the storytelling. So yeah, I am part of that team, and I love that aspect of my job. Right, and I know it, it, but it shows. It shows is I'm engaged from the beginning to the end. No matter how short the piece is, I can I can relate to the story behind it, but. So many. I remember getting to New York and doing jingles. Oh, we got to write. We got to do this song. I didn't even know what the product was. Oh wow! <laughs> At times I wasn't even conveyed. We walk into the studio. Here's the music. We record. Oh, we want to change this. We want to change that. We want to change this. We want to. And we just follow the orders, do the product, and and move on. So, kudos to you for being at the table because it it makes it makes your job more more worthwhile and it you can hear it in the product. Uh, well, thank you, Deanna. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank yeah. you so much. Well, you've shared so much with us. I definitely would love to have you back. Our time is up, but I would love to have you back. And um, this time was about getting to know JB, Jeanique Bonten. <laughs> but I would love for you to come back to explain and share with our audience the process of film scoring, because it is a process. It is. Uh, I'm not that versed in it, but I, I, I've been there. I've done a couple, <laughs> believe it or not, um, silent movies oh nice those where are someone have been commissioned to write music and we would like we're watching the music and playing at the same time and it's mm -hmm. it's like i'm not training for, for film scoring that's what we were kind of doing but it's a process that i i admire that process but i would love for you to come back specifically to share with our audience and maybe we can have some video clips of how that yeah. goes and how you line up the click and because that's a, a whole nother thing behind the scene that most people just see the finished product, but they don't see what really goes into that. And you really have that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And I'd be happy to do that because it's, I speak a lot about, a lot about the tools. tools. And I'd love to be able to share that with your audience. Great. Well, it's been a, a pleasure hearing your story. It's been um, a pleasure getting to know you. Over the, over the past couple of months, getting you to this point to come on the show. And um, again, we look forward to having you. And uh, any any uh, any little secret projects you got going on that you can share or anything coming up with it you can share with our audience? <laughs> Let's get out the bag. <laughs> well, I can't really do too much stuff out the bag, but I will say that I am working on a project I'm very proud of. It is filmed in Haiti, um, and it's going to be hitting – with a festival market very soon. So I'll announce it when it's available, but I'm very proud that I'm actually working on a film about Haitian uh, culture set in Haiti and filmed in Haiti. So I'm really happy about that. Okay, great, thank you. And I must mention Creed too, because you you were part of that. I was That's part of that as well, that is correct. I worked with the great Liv Gorenson, yeah. who uh, just won an Oscar for Oppenheimer. Yeah. So I was able to work with him on Creed 2. So, you know, quite honestly, Dion, my life has been a blessing because I have been in so many rooms, work with so many people that who gets that? Right. Who gets that? <laughs> JB does. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, only by the grace of God. So I'm so thankful. Well, man, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on board, um, joining us on Sounds of the Diaspora, and sharing your story with all of the folks um, within our community that um, take the time out of their, their lives to come and listen. So thank you for being here. No, thank you for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to coming back. All right. Take care. Right. Thank you. Includes our, um, our episode tonight. And I'm so happy that we had, uh, we are finally able to get uh, Johnny Bon Temp on the show, uh, amazing, amazing composer and film scorer. So you'll be hearing more about him. Uh, but come back next week as we have on the show my dear friend uh, Elio Villafranca from Cuba. This is a 
a gentleman that um, his story is equally amazing. Growing up and born and raised and growing up in Cuba, moving to the U.S. and doing amazing things. I actually just toured with him in Uruguay for for um, about 10 days down there in January and had a great time. So join us next week as we present to you Elio Villafranca. It's been a pleasure um, presenting this show to you tonight. You be safe. We'll see you next week. JBH Boutique Care offers you a unique exclusive membership in our nationwide concierge medical services network. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Judine Pontemps Hill. I'm double board certified in family and obesity medicine. We pair exclusive personalized care with accessibility and convenience. A better way for you to receive immediate quality medical care. Whether at our main Orlando, Florida office, traveling across the US or visiting the States, we bring you the best medical care without waiting for an appointment. Become a member today by calling 407-234-5282 or visit us online at jbhmeg1.com. JBH Boutique Care is proud to sponsor Sounds of the Diaspora, music and conversations with artists and host Dion Parson every Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on Source TV Radio Network, WTSN, Washington, D.C.